Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. How are you doing? Good? Right. Today we are going to talk about Aristotle's poetics. Uh, last time we discussed the views of Plato regarding literature by reversing the reasons behind uh, rejecting the poets or banishing the poets from the Republic. Our today's class is going to focus on the first part of the poetics for Aristotle, right? And the first part of the poetics concerns two major ideas. The first one, the definition of poetry and the classification of poetry according to the Greeks. Moreover, right, his response to the imitation that we already started to talk about last time, right? And uh, right, moreover, he discusses the concept of tragedy, which is one of the most important points that we are going to discuss, right, in this course. Uh, not only the definition of tragedy, but also, right, the elements of tragedy, as analyzed by uh, Aristotle. We mean the structure. Before we start explaining, right the points of our concern for today. I'm going to open the stage for sharings. Is there anyone who would like to share anything with us today? Right, are you expecting me that I'm going to be the, a one-man show, making a one-man show here, right? Or is it because we changed the room and we are coming here before the cameras? It means that we are not going to participate, no. Right? If I feel that you are not going to participate, right, I will uh, go back to my first class. You know. So I want my class to participate, especially. Right. I know that you are creative students, and expected that more than one is going to participate. Well. Fine. So if we want to start with the right, the poetry which was really known at that time. We can say that the most important types of poetry that was available, right, that were available at that time, it was the epic and the dramatic. What is the epic poetry? Are you familiar with the word epic poetry? Sorry, longest narration. Yeah, but what is the major topic of the epic? Sorry? Heroism. Heroism. What do you mean by heroism? Uh, describing an ideal hero. Right. Um, and talking about battles and wars and history. Right. That's good. Actually, right, we usually say that this type of poetry, right, it is the poetry that the chronicles the stories of heroes, the great deeds of heroes, and battles. Of course, these wars and battles, they are for a good cause. In other words, that it talks about a hero who goes into a journey of adventure, right? And this journey usually encounters evil forces like uh, right supernatural forces like right dragons right magic witches and he usually goes into right a fight with these right evil forces for a good cause and it usually ends with what with the, what we call it the victory of the hero the victory but not always not always this type of poetry is of oral tradition of oral tradition that it use usually moves from one generation to another orally right mm -hmm. okay and the other type of poetry which was known at that time it was dramatic, dramatic right yes. and the dramatic poetry it was you it was usually divided into two types the comedy and the tragedy well right the comedy is was not that famous at the time of what 
at the time of uh, right, the Greeks, but they preferred the tragedies. They preferred the tragedies. Right? Uh, the tragedies, usually, they chronicle a story of a fool, of a good hero, of a good hero. Right? And the great writers of the Greeks at that, at that time, they were three. One of them is called Aeschylus, and one is called Euripides, and the third one is called Sophocles, right? We are going to study, right, King Oribus for Sophocles, right? Uh, while the great epic writer of all time, not only the Greeks, is Homerus or Homer who wrote the Odyssey and the Iliad. Are you familiar with the Iliad? Well, fine. But these two types, they write Aristotle added a third type, a third type of poetry, right? He called it the dithyrambic or the lyric poetry, which is, right, right a Greek song, a Greek song. And what do we mean by a Greek song? It is usually, right, a love song that is played on a musical instrument and it is usually sung. It is usually sung, right? So he classified poetry not only in two categories, but in three categories. The first one, the epic, the dramatic, and the theorembic. To Aristotle, the best type of poetry is the dramatic, is the dramatic, particularly that tragedy, right? Right? Why? Because he finds that there is a kind of superiority. What is the superiority in the dramatic poetry? I mean, it shows the men that they are better than they are. Right, good. But there is still, right? We say that there is a kind of difference, right, between the epic and the dramatic, right? Good. The epic deals with a serious action too. too. The epic deals with a serious action, right? Okay. And it is a story of heroes. Mm -hmm. The same thing with the drama. Drama is it has a serious uh, topic, and also it talks about a hero who falls at the end. So, what is the superiority of the dramatic over the epic? Yes, please. Thank you, right? This is the point, that they differ, right? Not in the object, not, uh, right? But they're, they're in the manner, in the manner of imitation. They are different in the manner of imitation. Why? Because the manner of imitation in the epic is? Narration. Is narration, while the manner of what? The manner of, uh, right, imitation in the drama is? Action. Is action. So he thinks, the action or performance is much better than telling or narrating or no. narrating, right? And this is why he finds it superior. So the major focus of uh, Aristotle, right, it was the tragedy. His, his main concern, right, became the tragedy. So the second part of the, of the book, which is the poetics, is completely devoted to to tragedy, to a tragedy. What exactly does he write about that? He will make a definition for the tragedy. Then, right, he is going to make analysis for the structure of the uh, tragedy, right? So he uh, makes a kind of uh, uh, analysis into forms that are easy to be followed in any process of analysis. So what is the tragedy? What is the definition of the tragedy according to Aristotle? By the way, you don't need to want, right, I'm going to give it to you all. I mean, these slides are going to be uploaded to the group and they are going to be uploaded to my web page. You can download it from the web page. You don't need to want to take photos of these slides, right? Well, right, this definition here, it needs a little bit explanation, right? Right. He says that it is an imitation of an action that is serious, 
complete of a certain magnitude in a language beautified in different kinds of embellishments, right? It's through action, not narration, and through pity and fear, bringing about catharsis of these emotions. Well, right? I'm going to divide this definition into two parts, right? From the first word till the word embellishments, it will be the first part, right? And if through action and not narration is the second part of the definition. Let's talk about the first part, the first part, right? So he agrees that it is an imitation, but he doesn't find anything wrong in an imitation. So I don't want to repeat what I said last time, right? Because it is creative, because, right, okay, it has, it has a natural joy, because not all imitations are, are the same. Good, right. Then we come to the word action. So it imitates, right, action, right? What does he mean here? What comes to your mind? Sorry? It must be performed. Right? So the word action here, it might refer to two things. Action, it might refer to a story, right? Okay? Something that happened, right? Or action, it might refer to performance, right? So here he is talking about what? He's talking about the manner of imitation. The manner of imitation, right? It is imitation, but its manner is is action or performance, right? Or it is imitating a story that already happened, right? But it's through acting, it's through acting, right? Not through narration, not through narration. And this action must be serious, which is the first quality. What makes it different from the comedy, right? So here, the manner of imitation, which is action, makes it different from whom? From the epic. Why? Because the manner of imitation of the epic is? Is narration. While the second word makes it different from? From the comedy, right? Because it is the object of what? Of the comedy is not serious, but a trivial manner. While, right, the word serious is to make it different from what? What I said? It is from the comedy, which is uh, having, right, completely different object. This story must be complete. complete. What do we mean by complete here? What's your name, sister? Sirin. Sirin, fadal. Yeah. Has a beginning and an end. Yeah. Right. How about the middle? Yeah. The middle yeah. Right. Yeah. All right. Yes. delivers a complete message. A complete message. Yeah. Right, yeah. To be like a self uh, contained, to have beginning, middle, and um, like end, and to give a whole picture to the audience. Right, good. Yes, sister. No open English, no story in the middle of the middle. Excellent, yes. To mention the most important action in the, in the play, uh, and, the, and don't ignore, don't ignore the symbol actions, because it's like, they are, they are like a well, fine. What we mean by the word complete here, it puts a new right characteristics for right any other story. As if he is telling us that there are some stories which are acceptable and some stories which are not acceptable at all. The acceptable story is the complete story. And if we want to talk about complete, it means that it must have right a beginning, a middle, and end. What did he call the beginning? He called the beginning exposition. It must have exposition or introduction or introduction. The middle, he called it development or complication. We call it the development or complication. And uh, the third part is called, right, it is the resolution. It is, or he called it catastrophe. 
And I'm asking you a question. Why does he call the end as the resolution or the catastrophe? Do you know what's the meaning of the word catastrophe? Yeah. Yes, yeah. sister. It's a tragedy, and it must end with the fall of the hero. Not necessarily the death, right? But it might be a psychological fall, right? But not necessarily death. Not necessarily death, but death is possible. Death is possible. So what we understand also from the word complete, we understand the following. That, right? Yes. Yeah, I, I said that. Right. I, we understand that he doesn't accept any story which doesn't have an end. All right, an end. Right? So he divided the plots into types. Into types. Based on what? Based on this word, which is complete. So he said, right, Aristotle, that the plots are of uh, what? Of different types. The simple plot. The simple plot. What is the simple plot? Do you know what I mean of the word plot? Yeah. 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 Right. Good. Right. The word plot here, it refers to the story of the drama. Right? Okay. In a novel also as well. Right. It is supposed to be complete. Again, I'm repeating that the simple plot is the one which has a beginning, but it, an end, but it doesn't have a complication. Right? It is the story in which the hero, right, moves from, right, from happiness, right, to misery, or vice versa. Vice versa. For example, right, it is irrealistic. It is realistic you just take the example like this right you are a poor person right you are suffering a lot of troubles right then you wake up to find that all right there is a treasure right hidden under right the stairs of your house oh you are moving from misery into happiness directly directly all your situation becomes different or the opposite or the opposite this type of stories right okay is called a simple a plot which is actually not appreciated right nor encouraged by Aristotle right the second one right which is the complete plot the complete plot right the one that has a beginning a middle and in, right? Sorry? Must have a suffering, right? I'm going to give you actually more details when we start, uh, start talking about the plot, right? But, right, it should have the development as basic part. Uh, in addition, suffering is supposed to be basic part of the tragedy in the middle, in the middle, right? So this makes it more realistic. The worst type of a plot, according to Aristotle, is called the episodic. It is called the episodic. And what do we mean by the episodic plot? Yes. An incomplete story. But it ends, right, on what? Right? Yeah, on series as a form of series, episodes. Right? Sure. We will give more explanation about this after we finish when we come to the plot. But I'm just mentioning it today in order to prepare you for more explanation in the following classes, inshallah. Right? So this is the meaning of what? Of what we call it complete. Right? It must be a complete action that has a beginning, a middle, and end. Right? Yeah. Any incomplete is not a good uh, tragedy. Right? Whether not having a, a middle or not having an end. Well, of a certain magnitude, 
a certain magnitude it means a certain yeah. length yeah. right yeah. it is not supposed to be too long nor too short why why do you think it is not yes sister All right. Yeah, it will be very boring if it is too long, right? And if it is too short, will not be complete, right? If it is too short, the action will not be complete. And in both cases, it will not achieve the function which is generating, right? Pity and fear. Pity and fear, right? في حدا مش فاهم هناك؟ يا خوان. Please. مش عشان في كاميرا معناته انتوا ما تسالوش انا بعيد كمان مره do you have any question do i need to repeat anything anything to be explained well right if i ask it in the i mean the reverse way في حدا فاهم والباقيين اللي ما رفعوش ايديهم وين هذول عدم الانحياز Well, okay, so it is not supposed to be too long, nor to be too short. Because in both cases, that the purpose of the, right, of the tragedy will not be achieved. Right? In a language beautified in different kinds of embellishments. Well, so he is telling us about how it is supposed to be written. What kind of language is supposed to be written? The language used for writing the tragedy must be full of figures of speech. Embellishment here, it refers what decorations. Beautified with the different types of decorations. If we want to, be, to, to ask what does he mean by embellishments here, we can say it refers to two things. The figures of speech and the music. The figures of speech and the music, right? This is the reference to the word embellishments, right? The question that I usually ask, right? What type of language that is full of figures of speech and music? It is poetry, right? So indirectly we can understand that the language of what of the tragedy is supposed to be poetic language. It is supposed to be a poetic language that is full of figures of speech and it must be musical, right? Right. It can not necessarily be sung, but a musical with a rhythm, right? And a rhyme, right? But it is not supposed to be sung because the, the poetry which is supposed to be sung is not the dramatic, but it is the lyric. It is the lyric, right? Yeah. So, right, the language beautified in different kinds of embellishments. So this part of the definition from here to here, I will call it the qualities of the dramatic action. Dramatic action means this one, the action. Then an imitation of an action. What are the characteristics of this action? It must be serious. Must be complete. Right? Must be of a certain magnitude. Written in a language beautified in different kinds of embellishments. The word dramatic action means a plot. Means a plot. But we usually use the word plot for the short stories and the novels much more than we use it for the drama. Much more than we use it for the drama. It is preferred to use the word dramatic action, right, more than using the word the plot if we are talking about what? Drama. 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 Why? Because we analyze not a narrated plot, right, but it is an acted, what, performance, and therefore a dramatic action is much better used than using the word a plot, especially with with the drama, in drama, in drama. So again, who is going to tell me in short, what are the qualities of the dramatic action according to Plato, right? Yes, please. Serious, complete, have a certain length, and um, it uses a, a poetic language. All right, written in a poetic, in a poetic language. language. Good. 
Let's come to the second part of the definition, which is talking about the function of the tragedy, the function of tragedy. So he says that this action, right, if through the action, again, if through performance, and if through what? Not narration, emphasizing that, okay, the action, not narration, and through pity and fear, bringing about the catharsis. The word catharsis means evacuation. Means, right, evacuation of bad feelings, of bad feelings. Sorry? Purification, to purify yourself from the bad feeling. Right, cleaning the self from the bad feelings, right? Well, so he says that the ultimate objective of the tragedy is to have catharsis, right? Yes. To purify the self from the bad feelings, from the bad yes. feelings. And I'm asking, how would that happen? Yes, uh, through two action. methods, as he said. Uh, through action, not narration, and uh, through pity and fear. I need more explanation, I don't understand. Yes. When we when we see uh, when we pity the hero, we stop pitying ourselves. Good. And we uh, and we and we uh, become afraid of the hero. We stop uh, looking afraid of the things we are afraid of in our lives. Good. So, so I like it the way that you are putting it. Yes, please. Thank you. This is the first point. She started with the first point. The first point that that catharsis, right, comes it through watching, not through listening. Right? Yeah. Right? This is what makes it the drama or the tragedy superior to whom? To epic. So what we understand from this sentence, that a tragedy is able to achieve what? Catharsis, while narration or the epic is not having the same function or unable to achieve the catharsis. Why? Because we see the story. We see the story. It is acted through action. And he is emphasizing not only through action only, but he says through action, not narration. Right? To make it different from what? From the epic. Yes, the epic is good and the, right, it is the, right, also serious, but it is not like the tragedy. So the first method of achieving this purification of the bad feelings is, right, watching. Right? I am watching you. Right? <laughs> it's watching, right? Not listening. Not listening. Right? This is the first method. The second method, as he here tells in the definition, right? it is through pity and fear. And here we have to remember what was the attitude of Plato towards pity and fear. Right? Right. He said that pity, that, right? Yes. Why? Because they are more suitable to women than to men. It makes men to play a woman's role, right? So, right, actually he, one, the, one of the reasons for banishing the poets from the Republic was because poetry generates pity and fear, right? We find here his teacher, right, his, right, his, uh, I mean, uh, student says the opposite, says the opposite. He agrees, he says, it is necessary for what? Right. No, what kind of poetry, sister? Drama. For a drama. It is necessary, right, for a drama to generate pity and fear because it is not, there is nothing wrong. There is nothing wrong in what? In pity and fear. On the contrary, they have a major function. What is that major function? To generate, uh, sorry, to, uh, I mean to achieve catharsis. So we have two methods. When we watch, right, right, the, the action, and when generating pity and fear, they, it will achieve catharsis. How pity and fear will achieve catharsis? What is your name, sister? Zahra. Zahra explained this, right? Yeah. 
when we pity the hero, we stop pitying ourselves. Right? Yes. We start comparing between what is happening with us and what is happening with the hero. Right. And then we find that what is happening with us is nothing. Yeah, compared to what happens to to the hero. And that's good. Right? We sympathize with the hero. At the, at the same time, he's living a catastrophe, although he's good, although he is good. But if we are going to right, compare what we are suffering as audience to the suffering of the hero, you will find that your suffering is nothing compared to what he really suffers. And therefore, we feel that kind of evacuation of pity and fear. And as we usually say in Arabic, do you understand what I mean? Yeah. Right? This is what causes the cathartic, the cathartic effect. Right? Okay? And therefore, we stop pitying ourselves when we pity right, some other people. We stop pitying. We say, Alhamdulillah. Yes, Hal. Or another way of explaining it, that yes. we already have feelings of pity and fear, but during watching this drama and tragedy, they heightened a level that is so much that we have to evacuate it. So that could be another Excellent. Way. I like it. I like it, right? Right. Also, we can feel that our self is like a part of his, of his suffering process. So that will, will achieve. That someone is sharing us what we are suffering. Yeah. We are not alone, yeah. right? We are not alone, right? Who are, who are suffering on this earth. Some other people are like us, right? Which also helpful in the process of evacuation. Yes, sister. Yeah. Aristotle. All right, he disagrees with his teacher. <coughs> right. His teacher considers them bad, right? Because he thinks that pity and fear are more suitable to whom? To women, right? It makes people emotional, right? Not intellectual, not intellectual. So, right, he said, Right, Plato, I mean, he, he, he refers to Plato. Plato is not encouraging right, the generation of pity and fear by any type of poetry, especially the tragedy. While his student is the opposite, is the opposite. He thinks that they are necessary and they have a necessary function. What is that necessary function which is causing right, the evacuation of pity and fear? Look at the definition here, right? I want you to have a look at the word when he says, right, it's through action, not narration, and it's through pity and fear, bringing about. Bringing about it means generating the catharsis of these emotions. Catharsis, the evacuation of these emotions. What does that mean of these emotions? It refers to whom? Right. So pity and fear will evacuate pity and fear. How does this happen? Right? When we pity others, right? We stop pitying ourselves. Right? When we find this is one way to, to explain it. Right? Or when we see what others right suffer, right? We are no longer afraid of what we are suffering. Or some other way that when we find people they have the same problems, means that it, we have we are shared with the same problems. And therefore we will stop pitying and fearing from what we are having. Right? It makes a kind of relief, right? Getting out all these what? These feelings, right? From ourselves, yeah. right? So tragedy, it has a cathartic effect, a cathartic yeah. effect. But if it is not action, it will not bring catharsis. If it is not serious, it will not bring catharsis, bring about. If it is not complete, Right? It will not bring, right? Because it must be a complete story developed, right? And if it is too long, it will be boring. It will generate boredom rather than generating pity and fear. And if it is not written in a language, it will not be serious. A high language, a grand, sublime language. We call it, all right, the language beautified in different kinds of embellishments. It refers to the sublimity of language. What's the meaning of sublimity of the language? language? Right? Not the street language, not the common language, not the language of the common man, but it is supposed to be a language or sublime language. Right? And, uh, right, 
through the action and uh, right through the pity and fear, we will bring right the catharsis of these emotions. What do you think of this definition? Do you agree or disagree with them? Right? How many, right, let me ask you, how many, right, tragedies have you ever watched? Yeah, we are living a tragedy. <laughs> we are not watching a tragedy, is that correct? <laughs> but we hope that it, we are not going to end up falling down. Right? <laughs> Sorry? God's willing, inshallah. Insha well, so, right, do you have any uh, question about the definition of tragedy for Aristotle? Yeah. Yes. But nowadays, like while you're reading a book or a novel, for example, you can achieve, like the writer can achieve catharsis. Yeah. Because usually we uh, pity the heroes or um, the, her was a, the, the hero or the, or the heroine of the story. Right, but not with the same degree as you watch it. Yes. Yes. Right? Yeah. We, we don't deny that it, I mean, these things that we write that might lead to a kind of uh, sympathy. But according to Aristotle, I am not, by, by the way, I am not defending my own point of view. I'm explaining his own point of view. Mm -hmm. But if it comes to my own point of view, it will be completely different. I'm trying to write, to put myself in the position of whom? Of Aristotle. At that time, they never had short stories. They never had novels. They had also only two things, either epic or what? Or dramatic. And when he compared, he compared between the two things available at that time. He thought that what can be achieved by a drama is much more than what can be achieved by a pic, right? But if it comes to the modern genres like the novel and the short stories, the other types of na narratives, and the movies, the movies now that we are watching, they are a kind of what? Performance. They are a kind of performance. They are not a narration. So we sympathize with these things because as if they are performed on the stage, mm -hmm. but right on a private stage in our living room, right? <laughs> yes, sister. Because when you see the movie or the, or the thing by performance, you will feel that you are a part of this play. So yeah. You, so you, will, my, my you will live it. You will share it. Yeah. You will share the action, you, right? It will be more than when you read. Right. No, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but not in the same degree. Right. Yeah, I, I, I'm not going to say that it doesn't generate pity and fear or sympathy. It generates for sure, right? But we are discussing play, uh, Aristotle here. Mm -hmm. We are not discussing our point of view. I will take your note and I'll send it an email to Aristotle, telling him that, right? <laughs> right? That pity and fear can be generated by the novel. Right? And we will wait how, what he's going to, what to respond to our right inquiry. Right? Is that OK? Yeah. OK, then. Fine. So we will come right uh, to the explanation. And uh, what I explained is already what? Right? I mean, in, in a written form, that will make uh, uh, things easy for you. I explained what is meant by the word action. And uh, what's the meaning of serious? What's the meaning of complete? What's the meaning of certain magnitude? Everything I explained already, right, is in a written form. In case that you miss taking notes, you will find it in the slides when I upload them, inshallah. Right? This is what I wanted to do for today. And, uh, right, inshallah, we will complete next time. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.